Can you imagine with me a somewhat hypothetical scenario? It's the Rugby World Cup final. And Wales and England are the two finalists. <laughs> and I'm the referee. <laughs> now then, be honest, how many of you would be prejudiced against the decisions I would take? You would probably put your hand down. You would probably be swayed by some strange, unreasonable illusion that I might be biased towards one side. Be honest, you would, wouldn't you? You would be prejudiced against me, the referee, for no good reason at all, really. We've been following the, the journey of Simon Peter. Simon Peter was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. And we've seen some of the ups and downs along the way. Sometimes this man Simon, whom Jesus renamed Peter, the rock upon whom he would build his church, sometimes he got things wonderfully right. Other times he got things hopelessly wrong. Sometimes Jesus commended him and gave him a slap on the back. Other times he told him off in no uncertain terms. Simon Peter was one of those guys who would speak first and think later. He would put his foot right in it big time every so often. You sometimes, sometimes wonder, and how on earth did Jesus put up with him? And then I sometimes think, well, how on earth is he putting up with me anyway? How does he put up with any of us in all the mistakes, failures, etc., etc., that we make, but also the opportunity to give him joy and delight, the same sort of joy and delight that a parent can take in a child. But Simon Peter had prejudices. He was a Jew, and he had been brought up to believe that Gentiles were hardly human. And an Orthodox Jew would pray a prayer thanking God. And a male, this is a man in its time, so he would say, Thank you, God, that you have not made me a Gentile or a woman, but have made me a man. So if that isn't sexist prayer, I don't know what is. But those were the days in which we lived. And Peter would have been brought up to believe that Gentiles were somehow outside of the embrace and the scope of the love of God. That salvation was really for Jews and not for people who were not Jews. And so the way that Peter felt about Gentiles, it needed to be changed. It needed a radical reprogramming, if you like, of the software in his brain. There was, of course, a lot that divided Jews from Gentiles in those days. And the Apostle Paul, one of uh, Peter's uh, uh, colleagues eventually, refers in one of his letters to the dividing wall of hostility that divided Jew from Gentile. Think today, um, Israeli and Palestinian. There are walls still, literal walls, in the Holy Land. And, you know, now the two shall meet. Can you imagine a, a, a Hezbollah and a strict Orthodox Jew uh, coming together and warmly embracing one another? It, it's just not going to happen. And in Peter's mind, this didn't happen between Jews and Gentiles. And so, Peter is shocked when in a vision he's told to get up and kill and eat unclean animals. Animals which only Gentiles would eat because Jews, as you know, had and still have in some cases strict dietary laws about what they will eat and what they won't eat. This is the story as Luke, the early church historian, puts it in Acts chapter 10 and verses 9 to 16. We're told that about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. I remember 30 years ago there was a program which showed, um, it was a game show from another country and the participants had to eat raw sheep's eyes as part of this, you know, that, that's the sort of revulsion that Peter would have felt. 
a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And so the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened, Luke tells us, three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back up to heaven. You see, God was, I think, using shock tactics on Peter to get him to realize that the gospel was as much for Gentiles as it was for Jews, and crucially, on the same terms and conditions, faith in Jesus as the Messiah of God. And again, as a uh, Peter's fellow apostle was later to put it there. He said, is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what happened next? Well, a few miles from Joppa, where Peter was, there was Caesarea. And in Caesarea, there was a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius, whom Luke describes as a sincere God fear in Gentile, and he also had had a vision in which he was told to call for Simon Peter, and when he came, to listen to what he had to say. And having arrived at the home of Cornelius, Luke tells us this. While Peter was talking with them, he went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you have sent for me? And then Cornelius then explained to Peter how an angel had told him to send for him. And this was Peter's response. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. And as Peter went on to explain the good news about Jesus, Cornelius, his family and his household, which had been quite large, believed, received the gift of God's Spirit, and they were all baptized in water. Now, if you know the story, Peter, something I noticed in this was that that vision appeared to him three times. Hmm. Press rewind. Rewind to just before Jesus was crucified. And three times, Peter, with colorful language, denied that he even knew who Jesus was. It's called his denial of Jesus. And after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus uh, made a fire, and he asked Peter three times, Do you love me? And Peter said, Yes, Lord, I do. You see, three would have been significant. Three, hmm, God must be trying to say something to me through this. And so in that way, Peter's prejudices were overturned, they were challenged. And you know, for me, this is more than just an interesting story from church history, because God once used this very story to issue to me a course correction in my own thinking and understanding. But that is another story, and we haven't got time for that this morning. Don't look disappointed at this point, please. Interestingly, this morning, we've already read about a prejudice that Jesus challenged with respect to children. And here we are, thousands of years later, off the back of Jesus challenging the prejudices of his day, doing something that he, if you like, initiated in saying to God, thank you, and in asking God for his blessing, as we have seen uh, there with Cassia uh, earlier on. For those of you who are committed Christians, in your discipleship, have there been, are there now, prejudices that need to be put to one side? How open might you be to God putting his finger on them for you? Or you might be someone who perhaps unknowingly harbors prejudices about the Christian faith. I wouldn't be at all surprised if you do. There are lots of fake versions of Christianity out there. I sometimes say this, you know, has anybody got a forged 11 pound note? I'd love to see it if you have. You see, you only get forgeries of things that are real. You only get forgeries of things that are valuable. If there wasn't a real 
11. If there was a real 11 pound note, you'd have an 11 pound note forgery, but it isn't. You get forgeries of 10 pound notes or 20 pound notes. And I feel sometimes it's the same with uh, the Christian faith, uh, that there are people, that there are forgeries out there. It's not the real thing. And people have therefore got biases and prejudices against a faith. But when I talk to them, I discover the thing about which they have prejudices isn't what I believe anyway. But somehow they bought into the many forgeries and that are out there. I know that sometimes Christians are open to the charge of hypocrisy. I know that. But again, think of hypocrisy, hypocrisy as being the forgery. If there wasn't something real, you wouldn't get hypocrisy. So if you're prejudiced in any way against Christian faith, can I ask you, off the back of this story, to consider letting God in on your case and letting him show you something different, something that's real. Happy to talk to anybody afterwards, and if you know somebody who's a Christian you can talk to, then great. Sometimes we, we do an alpha course. It's not running this autumn, but it's starting again in the new year, in which we uh, explain and allow people to ask all sorts of questions about their faith. I'll leave that with you off the back of that story from the journey of Simon to Peter, from somebody who was a rough and ready fisherman, who sometimes got it horribly wrong, to somebody whom Jesus entrusted to preach the first Christian sermon ever and get the church rolling down 2,000 years plus of church history.